podcast world. What's up? We got a good one for you today. I hope you all aren't hungry right now because when you're listening to this, you're probably going to need to figure out where you're going to pull over or what you're going to pull out of the freezer, the fridge. It's almost like going shopping when you're hungry. That's what listening to today's podcast is going to be like walking down the aisle at your favorite butcher shop when you're hungry and you start just throwing everything in the basket. And myself, I have not personally been able to taste any of this man's food that we will be talking with today. But the proof is in the pudding. This dude knows how to throw down when it comes to backyard grilling, smoking, barbecuing. We're going to get into all that. I want to know some of the differences in what I just mentioned. On today's podcast, another episode of This Life Ain't For Everybody, brought to you again by our friends and family, the iconic Jack Daniels Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey. Every drop is made in the town of Lynchburg, Tennessee. Every single drop. Can you imagine that? It's sold in like a hundred and 77 different countries. Just think of all the places you go in your hometown, whether it's your local saloon, your local hangout, your local pub, your grocery store, your liquor store, your convenience store. If you live in a place like I do in Nevada where they sell alcohol everywhere, think about how much Jack Daniels is just within a 25 mile radius of you. Then take that and multiply it by 177 countries and every single drop is made in Lynchburg, Tennessee. That's what I love about the brand. So much culture, so much history. We truly appreciate what Jack Daniels does for us and all of our brands here at This Life Ain't For Everybody, the Foul Life Banded Brands. Enjoy it responsibly. Never allow underage drinking. Again, thank you, Jack Daniels, the original, the master, the iconic Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey. On today's episode, we got some people that understand what Jack Daniels is, not so much because of what you can pour out of a Jack Daniels bottle, into a highball or into a Jack and Coke or some of the apple or the honey or the Tennessee fire. We're talking about Jack Daniels barbecue. You've seen their rubs. You've seen their barbecue sauces. But did you know that there is an actual Jack Daniels Invitational Barbecue Championship held every October in the iconic town of Lynchburg, Tennessee? And today's guest, one of them, we have two of them on the, the podcast today. The first one is Tuffy Stone. Just Google Tuffy Stone. You talk about a master, and he is humble. Humility plays a big role in success in life, in my opinion. I know Tuffy lives by the same exact ethics and morals that my granddaddy, my daddy, my mommy taught me growing up. But the guy can just throw down. We're going to learn a lot today from Tuffy. We also have Jed Tourette who works full-time for Brown Foreman, the mother company that owns Jack Daniels. They've owned Jack Daniels for, I think, five or six decades. Correct me if I'm wrong, Jed. How long has Brown Foreman owned Jack Daniels? Since 1956. How many decades is that? You're way better at math, I can tell by your haircut. (laughs) It's been a while. I don't know, like six or seven decades. Tuffy, they say that when you go bald like this man, and I'm bald, but I have a hat on, it means your brain's bigger, right, Tuffy Stone? You know, I'm just going to keep my hat on and, and refrain to answer on that. <laughs> well, God only made so many perfect heads, and then he put hair on the rest of them. Yeah. Ooh, I, I like that. Hat on. There you go. When Needs you to hear on a shirt. When you, when you see the name Tuffy, the first thing I think of is like, Hulk Hogan's character in Rocky three. Like he could have been, mm. I know his name was thunder lips, but he could have very easily been named Tuffy. Like you think of a UFC fighter, Tuffy, I, I need an honest answer out of this. And I know you're going to give me nothing but transparency and honesty all day today, but <laughs> you got to have a competitive bone in you that is unmatched, right? You cannot go to all of these competitions that you have and continuously been given the blue ribbon or the first place trophy, because it's hard. It's got to be hard for these chefs to go. Or I mean, these judges to be like, Oh, this one's got this. And this one's got this. My point is there's a lot of good pit masters out there. You would say the same thing, I'm sure. You gotta be very competitive. Is this fair to say, Tuffy Stone? You know, I, I, I ask myself that often because sometimes I feel like I, I'm not that competitive. It, to, to me, it's like, I guess the competition is to myself. And and that, you know, I like to say, uh, I got lots of sayings. One of my sayings is the harder I work, the luckier I get. Um, but I, I often say, I like to get to a contest with a clean pit, good wood, sharp knives, fresh rub, basically everything that I need to be able to, to cook my best food. And so, you know, it's like, I don't know. It's like, part of me wants to say I'm not competitive. I mean, I was, 
I don't know. I mean, I was, I did great in cross country in high school and, and did well at that. So maybe I am competitive, but, but when I get to a contest, I'm not really thinking about who I'm cooking against. Uh, I'm just trying to cook my best. And for me, it, it starts weeks out from the competition. So, you know, I don't know, I probably need to, you know, do a little psychotherapy and find out whether I'm competitive or not. But, uh, uh, but I don't I don't find myself thinking about trying to beat people. I just try and think about it doing my best. When I think about people that get to a certain level of let's call it the game. All right. There's lots of different games. It might be myself, right? Well, oh man, he's a duck hunter. Hey, blow this duck call for me. Blow this duck call. Hey, can you show me how this, hey, did you hear about the ducks? It's like they all, it's kind of like when I go to Italy, Tuffy Stone, I want to speak Italian. I want to show those Italians, man, I've been practicing up. Ciao, ciao, rivederci, come stai amico, you know? But then they're like, we want to speak English because we want to practice our English now that there's an English speaker here from America, right? But my point is, Tuffy Stone, is do you get, tired of people asking you to cook for them or letting, Hey, give me an idea of, of how to, uh, how to get the right smoke or what's the right internal temperature of a brisket. I'm sure you get inundated with maybe even your wife, your family, like, yo, Tuffy, we need some of those ribs today. And you're like, Oh man, do you ever get tired of it? Tuffy? I think we all get tired. I think every now and then you got to rest. You got to re you know, recharge, you know, whether it's get out there and go fishing or duck hunting or do something different. Um, you know, maybe rest, you know, um, I, you know, the guy that gave me the nickname, the professor, uh, he, when he, when he gave me that nickname, he said, Tuffy, you can talk for hours on smoke and fire and wood. And, and he's right. I'm really passionate about, it. I like, I like teaching a whole lot. I've always enjoyed teaching people how to cook even long before I learned how to cook barbecue. Um, you know, I think, I think sometimes we're so accessible to, to, to be able to, get questions asked to us, whether it be Facebook or Instagram or, you know, through your website or whatever. And, and sometimes I'll get that email. It's like, how do you cook a brisket? And as much as I want to sit down and type out that answer, you know, that's pages and pages uh, and lots of information. So I sometimes feel bad that I can't answer and, and, and teach everybody uh, right then and there what I want. But yeah, I guess we get, I mean, we, I think we all get a little, beat up every now and then you got to like refresh, but it's been interesting. You know, I, I've been cooking for a living since the eighties and I got my first barbecue pit back in 2004, just to reconnect with cooking. And what are we, you know, 2021. And, and I honestly speaking, I, I, I was smoking uh, chickens on Sunday and the therapy that I was getting from that process and, and just, you know, uh, felt good. You know, it's like when I light that fire, when I take that modest cut of meat and make a rub and season it up and try and cook something delicious, that part I don't get tired of. Um, uh, and maybe I will, you know, because historically, you know, I can get really interested in the topic and then move on to the next one, but I've been kind of stuck with cooking with fire now for a while. We're going to get into cooking with fire and, and like Tuffy's team, Cold Smoke, and the nickname, The Professor. I mean, come on. I mean, what a nickname to get because you can make a chicken taste good. Something's <laughs> got to be going on. Jed Lorette. Jed Lorette works for Brown Foreman, like I stated. Works for Jack Daniels. Jed, give me some insight of what you think about when we get to this time of year. The Jack Daniels is coming up. It's in Lynchburg. Lynchburg smells good year round because of the charcoal, right? Uh, the Jack Daniels distillery is there. There is some parts of the sour mash that might be a little bit aroma awakening when you first get there, but man, as a whole, that place smells awesome. But come October, it's going to be on a different level and you know this better than anybody. Give us some insight of what's getting ready to go down, what you're in charge of, what do you do for the, for the Jack Daniels and, and what is the Jack Daniels invitational that happens every October in Lynchburg, Tennessee? Well, we've been doing this uh, Jack barbecue invitation only competition for 32 years. Um, it, it's like adding the sweet smell of mash and the smoke of barbecue in the holler. Uh, you're getting it from all over. It's a sensory overload. It's unbelievable. People come from all over the world. They show up at Jack Daniels, and it's so fun to find out 
what it is they think they're smelling. Some people smell peanut butter. Some people smell brownies. Some people I had just the other day smelling fried chicken. I really wish it was fried chicken, but uh, it, it, it's, it's so amazing. So you're right, man, the mash and the holler at the same time over in Wiseman Park, they're going to be, you know, smoking some amazing cuts of meat and uh, competing for a prize. It's an opportunity for people all over the area to show up. We had 40,000 people uh, the year before COVID hit. And uh, we're expecting uh, an influx of people this year as well. Oh, I cannot wait. Hey, Jed, answer me this in all honesty, which again, mm-hmm. I know that you're not going to give me anything but honesty and transparency today. Yeah, exactly. Somehow I feel like a lawyer right now talking like that. Exactly. I don't want to sound like that. Do you ever, I, I, I kind of coined this term and I'm sure that, that you guys are going to say, ah, I've heard that before, but in what I do, I like to take a lot of pride in what happens in my backyard. And I think when you said COVID, I think a lot of people got back to wanting to be in their backyard, what it meant to be in their backyard with family and friends, obviously small gatherings for the most part during the last 18 months. But I always talk about what I call the backyard aficionado. Like Mm. when I, when I serve those ribs or that pork or that wild duck or that speckle belly goose or that tenderloin out of a Rocky mountain elk, I want people to be like, that's good. I don't want them to be like, oh, that's the best meat. You don't want to be that guy, right? But you want to have pride in it. Do you ever catch yourself being like, man, Tuffy ain't got nothing on this? Like, do you ever get like an attitude like, man, I freaking can throw it out? Come on, dude. You got to admit it, Jed, that we sometimes think in our heads that we can compete with a Tuffy Stone, right? No, absolutely. The best thing is to know thyself. I can kill somebody with my Boston butt. I mean, it's like it comes off the grill. A couple of years ago, my son and I, who's going to be 15, uh, we decided we were going to start smoking. I got to be honest, until I got a hold of that pink paper, it's like butcher paper. When I got a hold of that, the whole game changed for me. But man, buying a $60 brisket and turning it into shoe leather, it doesn't feel good. No, it's <laughs> awful. So no, I never think I'm on the level of toughy. I just want to cook it so you can eat it and it won't kill you. You know, <laughs> I, 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 so I, I, no fear. you got the game, bro. You don't have to worry about it. I'm not coming for you. You know, but I think there's, there's some truth. Um, I think some of the best barbecue cooked in America is cooked in the backyards of America. I, I and, and, uh, and, and unless, you know, I always say barbecue is the friendliest food. It's the most gregarious cuisine. It's, it's a, it's a food that where we're taking tough cuts of meat and trying to coax something great out of them. It's it's historically family reunions and picnics and and you know large gatherings of people and and um, and and anybody that cooks barbecue knows that it it doesn't get any better than when it comes off that smoker or that grill and it rests just for the right amount of time and then you just take that first bite and that's hard to that's hard to duplicate or to beat. And so I, you know, I think I cook pretty good barbecue, but I think there's a lot of great barbecue out there. It's, it's amazing. And I think you're exactly right. It's that time you spend with another person. I mean, that's something we're never getting back is that time we share with each other. And so when it's me and my boy in the backyard, it might be over a piece of meat, but it's a conversation that we're having. And, and, and maybe my meat turns out the way it does because I had just one too many jacks in the glass before it finished. Oh, you never know. <laughs> uh, I, I think, I think, I think it's appropriate to bring up barrel man. Mr. Kevin um, taught me a year ago that the best mixer for Jack Daniels. Can you right? finish? Can you finish it, Jed? No, I can't. What is it? Conversation. Conversation. And that's, it, it that's a good way to look at barbecue, too, is, is that or, uh, too? I shouldn't say too, but too is that just the conversation, the camaraderie we we in this world of likes and instant gratification and ambassadors and influencers. It's so easy to get caught up in the stuff that might not be that important in the long run and and, and laying down a good brisket in the backyard or the ribs. I, that's what I kind of mean by the backyard aficionado. We have a company that, that we call the provider, you know, we have dry rubs and we have a cookbook coming out in November and I want to show Tuffy the cookbook just to get his opinion on it because I value his opinion on, and I want to, I want to bring this like 
mindset like, hey, man, living off the land is cool. Whether you're growing a garden or raising your own beef or pork or chickens or sheep or hunting or fishing, being able to make that into a bounty to put on the table that's respectful and that you have a lot of passion for. I think that's everything. And when you hear somebody that has these accolades that Tuffy gets, but still has the humility that, Hey, some of the best barbecue in the world happens right here at 95, 95. I'm not going to give my whole address, but in my opinion, there's been some really good food that's come off of these grills here. We use Traegers. I know Tuffy uses open, you know, open, just wood and he and he's mastered the art of smoke i want to transition in to a question tuffy about what goes along with what jed just laid down is this your main reasoning for the style of cook you do so you're so you're always checking it and flipping it and turning it and making sure that the wood is hot and the charcoal's there it's at the right temperature because you like being around it you like having that camaraderie and that conversation and that that cocktail or that cold beer that coca-cola classic or whatever you drink when you're cooking is that why you don't use one of the revolutionary or whatever you call the new the new craze with pellet grills and kind of just like set it and forget it attitude You know, um, I won't get into my whole background, but I'm a little uh, different in the barbecue community because I started off in the French kitchen cooking all this hard to pronounce expensive food. And and I got my first barbecue pit. You know, I'd had grills all my life, but I got my first barbecue pit in 2004 because um, I had grown my business with my wife to where I wasn't cooking anymore. I was just managing the company and, and, you know, it was a catering company. and, And all of a sudden I found myself needing a new culinary activity to reconnect as a cook and so in my mind i wanted to i wanted to learn how to cook barbecue with all wood burning fire i think i've always had a little bit of a pyro in me uh but you know i like playing with fire i like building campfires i like uh, burning a fire in the fireplace um i like barbecue anyway i can get really windy on barbecue but um i love the process of running a clean fire. I read a book that inspired me by, a, uh, he's unfortunately passed, but a really great barbecuer, John Willingham. And in his book, he said, smoke is dirt. We're cooking, we're not smoking. And that really stuck with me. And I thought about, you know, maybe back in the days when all we had was wood burning ovens and somebody that had to bake a cake, they probably knew better than anybody this, this whole process of running a clean fire. I mean, people walk by my pit all the time and say, when are you going to light up? But if you look at my stacks, nothing's coming out. But I've been cooking for hours. Um, I just this morning, you know, cut my wood uh, for this weekend coming up. I hand cut every piece and they're really teeny pieces of wood. And it takes a lot more work the way I'm doing it. But, you know, pellet cookers are great because pellet cookers run super clean. We can set it and forget it. Uh, You can turn so many people on to cooking barbecue that way because we're all so busy now. There's not enough hours in the day to cook a brisket every day the way I do it. And, uh, but a pellet cooker is sweet, but you know, I just, I, I, I don't get persnickety. I like people just get in their backyard and fire it up and cook. And I don't care if that's uh gas grill, charcoal grill, pellet grill, or a stick burner, just get outside. Everything's so fast now, you know, no one's, you know, no one's waiting for a letter in the mail anymore. It's a text. It's a tweet. It's an email. It's a, but you know, when we get light that fire for a second and take, take a rack of ribs or a brisket or a pork butt and, try and make something good out of it. That's when I think we just sit back and, you know, live life a little bit again. Tuffy, educate Jed and I and the listening audience on what do you mean by smoke? You made mention of the author and the great barbecue um, pit master that talked about smoke is dirt. But my opinion, and I want you to educate me on this because everybody's got an opinion and we know what they're like. Um, I don't like a ton of smoke, but maybe I do it wrong. Is what is what is it with smoke? Do you want a lot? Do you want a little? Do you want medium? Or is it to where you don't even know there's evidence of smoke there because it just becomes part of the taste experience or the palate and everything that's going on once the food's on the on the tongue? All right. So I like to say I like to treat smoke like salt and pepper. Uh, I want that smoke to be a seasoning to my meat. I want the meat to be able to be tasted and i want the smoke the rub and the sauce to be a backdrop flavor that complements the natural meat itself the bigger the meat the more smoke the 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 thinner the meat the more delicate the meat the less smoke uh one of the things that i've learned i've been you know i somebody i work with uh 
they said to me about six months ago, they said, Tuffy, you, you've been cooking a lot of chicken this year. Uh, COVID has been really tough to my, my businesses and my industry. And uh, if ever there was a time where I felt like I needed to cook my best food was the food I was cooking for people during COVID, you know, to try and, you know, keep, keep them coming back. And, um, and one of the things that I started to realize during this process, I mean, I've, I've been running, I've been cooking a whole lot, you know, we we're uh, anyways, sometimes it's my mood. Sometimes I want it really smoky. Sometimes I just want to wisp of smoke. Uh, and so, but I think a lot of us can probably relate to buying our first barbecue pit. Um, maybe it's a little small offset and, you know, you fire that thing up and you season that meat, you put it on your cooker and you see all this smoke coming out of your stack and you say, yeah, I'm smoking. Well, you know, I think there's probably two mistakes that most of us have made on our initial attempts of barbecue. One is putting too much harsh smoke on whatever it is that we're cooking and not cooking our meat to the right tenderness. Those are probably the two big ones. You cook on a, on a pellet cooker. Pellet cookers are really sweet because more than likely, you're not going to over smoke your meat when you cook on a pellet smoker. But there's other cookers out there where you can quickly do that. Uh, uh, I run a teeny little fire because the more my fire can breathe, the, the better tasting that smoke is. When a fire gets starved for oxygen, it becomes it becomes bitter. It creates creosote, and and that's when it's not an un, that's when it's an unpleasant eating experience. But I think I would just tell everybody that's watching or listening: treat smoke like salt and pepper. The bigger the meat, the more smoke flavor you want on it. The more delicate, the lighter the smoke you want on it. And hey, it's your food. And if you're in the mood for a smoky steak, get a smoky steak. Okay. What he, Jed brought up brisket and brisket's a tough one for me, Tuffy, tough one, Tuffy. Um, sometimes I love it. Sometimes I'm like, ah, man, I could go without it. Sometimes it's great to have a brisket taco bar. Sometimes I'll have a Wagyu one from some of the different companies and badass ranches out there that are growing great Wagyu beef right now. Um, but sometimes I eat a Wagyu one in two bites. I'm over a Wagyu brisket because it's so rich and bold. Am I am I am I expecting too much from my brisket experience, Tuffy? Do you like brisket? Do you love the taste of a perfectly cooked brisket? And please answer that question with the follow up of staying on the theory of smoke. What is a smoke ring when it comes to brisket, and what are we looking for in a smoke ring? Well, you know, to answer all your questions, first of all, w the way you were reminiscing or talking about how you feel about brisket, I feel the same way about beef ribs sometimes. Sometimes beef ribs are just a little, they're just a little too filling for me. I, I, it gets, a, I feel it's a little too rich. Uh, it's too sated. Um, you know, I, I would say everybody uh, out there, if you're looking to do your first brisket, uh, probably most people when they cook their brisket for the very first time, They've been cooking it for hours and hours and hours, and it's up to 180, 185 degrees. And it's like, surely this thing's got to be done by now, but it's not. Most people don't cook them long enough or tender enough. So I'd say everybody season them 12, uh, excuse me, eight hours before you're going to put them on the grill. So season them up, even if it's just salt and pepper or if it's a recipe you get on the internet or recipe to get out of your upcoming cookbook. But, uh, you know, season those things overnight, get up in the morning, get your grill going. Uh, I like to cook about 275. I'm going to put about four hours of smoke on on that brisket. And at that point, I'm going to do the Texas crutch. You know, Jeb was talking about butcher paper. You can use butcher paper. You can use aluminum foil. But, you know, I like to I like to spritz with apple juice a lot. You know, I'd like to just keep some moisture on it during that cooking process. But when it's got that nice, you know, mahogany brown charred color on it and it's just looking really good. I like to wrap it at that point. I, I can now stop the smoking process, treating smoke like salt and pepper. Um, by wrapping it, I'm going to keep that moisture in. And if you're cooking it at uh, 275, probably about three hours later, it's going to probably be close to, to the tenderness you're looking for. And that's going to be somewhere between 195 and 205 degrees Fahrenheit. And then you got to rest. The bigger the cut, the longer the rest. The the you know steaks. I might let I might let them rest for five minutes once they come off the grill. But a brisket, I like to let those rest for a couple of hours. Some of your legendary Texas brisket joints, 
will rest those briskets for eight hours, you know, and that's where a lot of the magic happens. But, um, you know, you talk about Wagyu, you know, sometimes so there's certain briskets out there where the, the fat, the marbling can be so, uh, so much that sometimes it can be a little rich. And, and so you got to render that out during the cooking process. Uh, if you take a cut like prime or, or choice, there's not going to be as much, uh, intermuscular, uh, fat in there. And, and so it won't be as rich, but, um, but that smoke thing is like, I, th- I, you, you talked about coin in a phrase, the, the backyard of fiction and auto. I, I, I coined the phrase, the stereotypical expected flavors of barbecue, because being a French trained chef and getting into barbecue, I learned a hard, lot of hard lessons. You know, I used to think, you know, white truffle salt's great on brisket and it is, but don't take it to a barbecue contest because people aren't expecting that. But, um, but they are expecting smoke. You want some smoke flavor there. And so a, a, a cut like brisket, you know, we can go stronger in that smoke flavor. Um, but let's, let's taste the beef too. I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, or not. You, you did, but I have a follow-up question before I ask Jed and you a very important question. Very important, Tuffy and Jed. So have your thinking brain on in a second. Um, okay. So, it's not done at 180. So, okay, through some mutual friends, I'm going to assume mutual friends, my friends who I believe you're probably buddies with and competitors with, uh, Matt Meat Church Pittman and Chad Whiskey Bent Barbecue Ward from uh, Florida, both good friends of mine, great barbecuers in my opinion, great pit masters in my opinion, great, great uh, entrepreneurs in my opinion. But through those guys and their knowledge in the last 60 months of my life, I've learned that you cook it to 204, you let it rest to about 140, 145 before you slice it. Is this kind of where you were going with your internal temp? And have, we, have we developed too much of an ego if we don't use an internal thermometer to check the meat and we're just trying to use our fingers in today's day and age, Tuffy? No, I think, um, you know, one of the things I'd also tell your viewers and your listeners, you know, listening and watching this show, um, the more that we do it, the more intuitive it's going to become for us. Uh, these things are repeatable. Um, I, I like to, when I teach, I talk about, you know, baking cookies or baking a cake. If you've ever had a cookie recipe that you like and you bake them all the time, you eventually get to the point where the smell lets you know that they're close. The peak in the oven tells you that it's not quite yet time to touch them, but in a minute, I'm going to touch the top of that cake and check it for doneness. Uh, it's like, and, and, and these meats are the same way. So I think anybody that's cooking whole hog or brisket every day for a living, day after day after day, you can get to the point where by touch, you can, you can say, all right, that's, the, that's where it's at. It's done. But if you're if you're new, I'd say get you a good thermometer and 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 trust that thermometer. And and you know, this is another thing I teach a lot too is trust in our senses, trust in our our sense of touch, our sense of smell, our eyes, you know, our ears. You know, I listen to the sizzle of a pan. I listen, you know, uh, my they say if you're looking, you're not cooking. Well, I'm sorry, I like to look. I like to peek, you know. And but I'd say trust all your senses when you cook. And you can absolutely get to a point through through doing it enough, be able to know by touch that 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 piece of meat is done. Um, but for people just starting out, if you're going to invest eight hours of your day, twelve hours of your day cooking a brisket or or pork butt or something like that, uh, a thermometer, a meat thermometer can be a useful tool. Unbelievable knowledge. No wonder they call you the professor. <laughs> um, I mean that with all sincerity, too. It's unbelievable to be able to listen to somebody with so much passion because I internalize this. I have the ability, and that's what I love about podcasting, Tuffy Stone and Jed, is that our listeners can go back and listen to this. It becomes a tutorial. Now, it might not be every every answer to every question they have, but I'm just trying to get some of the things that I encounter and I just ask both of you men, please, to have your thinking caps on on this one. You might think this is a very elementary question, but 
Jed, you mentioned your pork butt. You mentioned making a brisket shoe leather. You probably have made as many mistakes as I have in the backyard, but it's all about trial and tribulation and trying different things. And I might throw something away before I ever serve it to somebody because it's not quite right. I just did it with burgers yesterday. I tried a new thing with burgers yesterday, trying this high heat method, and I absolutely Wayne gretzky them. You literally could have put them into the net. So in today's day and age of dry rubs, Jed, do you ever find yourself marinating anything anymore? Do you throw some chicken legs in a Ziploc bag with the marinade? And Tuffy, I want you to be thinking about this. Should I feel lesser of a cook, French trained like yourself? I'm not. I'm saying you are. You're, you've won all these competitions. Is marinating against the law today? Tuffy, be thinking about that when Jed's answering. Do you still marinate anything, Jed? I, I do. And if I can have a separate follow up to this. All right. Because sure. listening to Tuffy talk, I definitely want to add something to what he said. But yeah, to, to get to your point, I marinated probably about 10 uh, chicken breasts. We cut them in half. We butterflied them and we just used Italian dressing last night. Put it in a Ziploc bag, put them on my Blackstone and I grilled them out probably about two hours worth of marinating. So, yeah, I did it last night. Uh, but for the most part, there's a lot of good dry rubs out there. And I'll be honest with you, uh, the flavors that they're coming out with are pretty amazing. So uh, I, I tend to use dry rubs a lot more than I would uh, marinades. Um, it used to be, you know, the pre-mixed, uh, you know, juice in a bottle. And that's what you'd put your steak in or something like that. But now it's rarely ever marinated. It's always a dry rub on top. Tuffy. Oh, wait, wait, this is your follow up. up. Let me, let me follow up real quick. And, and, And Tuffy, he is very humble about what he does, but the whole time I was listening to him, it it compares so well with what we do here at Jack and what my primary job is. And that is to run my mouth and Tuffy, what you're doing. The truth is, is you're connecting people and yourself and your family with the way this country was founded, it was all over open heat. I mean, when we first came here, you had to know how to cook. Uh, you could you could cook a steak and it wasn't good to eat. Well, the guys who were rustling the cattle just didn't have anything to eat. So you didn't have that job long. And so uh, what I do as a storyteller, that's a lost art. And so what you're doing is something that, yeah, uh, the Traeger grills are great. And especially for the new you know, pit masters in the backyard, it's really um, comforting to know that that's being helped. But if you have the thermometer, still touch that meat. I mean, you know, still learn the actual sight and feel of what that end product supposed to look like. Uh, my son, again, 15 years old, I've taught him the, the finger method, you know, like to check your doneness on the steaks mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Yeah. It blew his little mind. He's like, seriously, you can just do that? And so uh, trying to show him that you can actually touch that meat and see if it's right for you. But it's it's reconnecting people with their roots. What he's doing, what we're doing on a daily basis here, seeing twelve hundred people a day, telling them stories, connecting with them. And again, slowing them down for a second and saying, hey, look, life's fast, but you're in the holler. We can slow down now and just take our time. And so I, I was typing I was typing while y'all were talking, going, what he's talking about is the founding of our country. It's the way, you know, I guess mankind began, you know, still telling stories over a campfire and cooking over that campfire. And For so, sure. yeah, I'm sorry. I went on a rant. I no, you, I like that. your, I like <laughs> your rant. We need more rants like that instead of some of the rants that are being talked about lately. Tuffy. You can uh, yes, respond to that a little bit on Jed's reply to your notion of open fire. And then I would really like to know if you would slap me around if you saw me pouring a marinated something onto the grill. Well, you know, Jed, one of the things that you said reminded me of something that uh, happened to me years back. We were filming barbecue pit masters. I don't remember what season it was. And um, we were going to do an episode in Virginia. So the producers um said Tuffy we want you to talk on Virginia barbecue and uh and I've got a friend here in Virginia who wrote a book on Virginia barbecue and uh he feels like it's my my place to put Virginia back on the map uh with Virginia barbecue but anyways I was I was trying to prepare myself and do a good job for this part of the show and I'm reading this piece now you got to remember you know 
I've been I've been teaching and preaching. Uh, I treat smoke like salt and pepper now for you know over a decade, and 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 running a clean fire is you know part of my whole focus. And uh, and I'm reading this 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 story, and it's George Washington's nephew, and he's coming in by horse to this uh, political picnic, and he comes upon this scene where they have dug holes in the ground and they're burning a hickory fire adjacent to the holes and they have hogs uh, on, on top of these hickory coals. And, and this is hundreds of years ago and they're already burning the fire away from the pigs, moving the coals underneath the pigs. And, and it was at that moment reading this that it dawned on me that I'm not so clever that people have known this for hundreds of years. It's about like a this rediscovery. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but, you know, going back to marinades, I like I feel like I went off the barbecue deep end back in 2004, and, and I just became so consumed with rubs and sauces and, you know, how to run a fire and how to cook ribs and pork and brisket and all these things. But, um but if you look at my cookbook, you're going to see there's there's a lot of dry rubs in there and a lot of sauces. But I I'm a, I, I lean on brines a whole lot. Brines are very important mm-hmm. to me. Uh, spritzes and sprays are really important to me. Uh, marinades. Absolutely. And, you know, I know this, you know, I will get into soy based marinades with ginger and garlic and scallions and, you know, uh, chilies and, you know, uh, I'll, I'll get into citrus acids, you know, like lime marinades and, and orange marinades. And so um, I to me, it's about flavor. And I think whether we're doing a quick cook or a long cook, um, you know, Chad, you talked about you know, cooking elk loin or, or duck and, and, and making a meal that impacts somebody and moves them. And I think we, we do that two ways. And one is flavor, you know, bringing that flavor that just, you know, uh, just as, you know, it, it hits them in such a way to where they'll never forget it. Another is, is hitting that perfect tenderness, that perfect texture, you know, uh, Chad, you know, better than I do uh, the best duck, or the best goose is going to be the duck or the goose that didn't get overcooked. You got to have, you got to have a medium rare raspberry, maybe even a little less than medium rare, but I would, I would venture to say that being French trained that you, I, my goal uh, ever since I've been, uh, you know, given this introduction to you and a little bit of your world toughy is to, is to hang with you at duck camp someday and taste your duck because I think that it's the most underrated meat there is. And if I had one, if I was on death row, which I never will be, I assure both of you, but my (laughs) final, my final meal, I love sushi and I love all meats. I love all fishes. I love it all, but it would be California rice, speckle belly goose prepared the right way. Skin on with a render, um, crispy skin, maybe with a reverse sear, 129 degrees internal temp probably when i slice it uh toughy i'm telling you duck is amazing and i bet through a french trained background that you could blow some minds am i lying or do you think i'm on to something here toughy stone you're on to something and i'll tell you what so my when my book was published may of 2018 my first two i don't know if they were trolls or what but my first two uh book reviews on amazon gave me poor reviews because I had goose pastrami recipe in the book. Well, I hunt and fish. So I've got rockfish recipes in the book. I got uh, uh, dove recipes in the book. I got uh, wild duck, goose, venison. Uh, and as I was writing my recipes and, and cooking through the seasons that, you know, I went hunting, I, I came home and I turned it into a recipe and this goose pastrami, there's a lot of people. So we, we shoot uh, Canadian geese here in Virginia, and and a lot of people don't like the taste of them. Uh, it's 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 more strong. Well, I took the goose breast and I made this goose pastrami. You you cure it for three days, and then when you grill it, it gets a wisp of smoke. You cook it to about 138 degrees, chill it, and it is so amazingly good. And and as I read those reviews, and you know, I, you know. Uh, doing a book can be a very personal revealing kind of thing. And, you know, you, you want to do your best with it. You want to put everything that you have into that book and reading those two reviews on, on, on beating me up because I had goose pastrami in the cookbook. And I was like, man, you need to make it and just taste it 
because I think you'll like it. Um, it it's really good. Um, I've done it a lot, and I absolutely agree. Pepper, uh, the brine, or whatever you want to do with the cure on it. It's a uh, goose pastrami, snow geese, Canada geese. Um, absolutely incredible. The other thing. What do they thing- call uh, spe- speckleberry ribeye of the sky? Yep, speckleberry. Yeah. A lot of people are calling a sandhill crane that now, and I completely disagree. Even though everybody's entitled to their opinion, I would put speckleberry goose up against. Have you had it? I have. Uh, uh, I have not uh, had the pleasure of. I, I've been down where there's a lot of them being hunted, but I have not. I've not. Uh, I've not been able to hunt one, but uh, I've had it. It's great. Arkansas, Louisiana, a little bit of southern Mississippi, southeast Texas, but the number one destination now, Tuffy Stone and Jed, is probably the Sacramento Delta in north to Chico, California. You can kill 10 speckle belly geese per man per day because of how wow. many are in the Pacific Flyway. So I will invite you to a camp out here and we'll enjoy some speckle belly hunting that'll blow your mind. But let's transition a second, Tuffy, and Jed's going to be a part of this discussion as well. Lynchburg, October. You've won it three times, three freaking times. I mean, this, this is a big deal. This is invitational only. This means that you had to accomplish something to get invited to the Jack Daniels. Tuffy 2019 was the last time you cooked in Lynchburg because there was not one in 2020. There's going to be some differences this year. The biggest one being your old man, your dad, your cooking partner, your best friend. My dad was my best friend. I lost my dad. He died in hunting camp of a heart attack. Um, A lot of people say, well, at least he died doing what he loves. And I understand that. But my dad was way too young to go because he was we were boys. All of my two brothers, my mom, my dad, we were we had it going on. Miss him every day. Um, I understand what you've gone through. But this year is going to be different, Tuffy Stone. It's going to be a different mental approach, probably. It's going to be a different hanger on, a different who you're going to lean to, who you're going to talk to. What's going through your mind right now? How difficult is this for you to even fathom being in Lynchburg without Pops? And and talk to me a little bit about what it means to at least have his memory there, knowing that you've won this three times and your dad is going to be there, if you know what I'm talking about, Tuffy. I know exactly what you're talking about. Um Last time I cooked a barbecue contest with my dad was at the Jack Daniels 2019. Um, his three brothers, my uncles, come every year. It's tradition. The, my three uncles and my dad play cribbage uh, right by the pit at a table. Uh, my uncles are coming. Uh, my goal was to teach them how to run the fire like my dad ran the fire. Um, my dad... My dad used to say all the time that he was the luckiest dad in the world. Um, He was so proud of the accomplishments that we were so blessed to have in in competition barbecue. Uh, You know, he just, he was, uh, I think, uh, I think being part of Cool Smoke and traveling all over the country and uh, the blessings that we had just, uh, he loved the Jack so much when, Anybody that comes to the Jack and rolls into that town square and down into the holler, the energy that's there is tremendous. You know, we talk about how fast everything is these days, but when you get to Lynchburg, Tennessee, uh, and you see that town square and you see those beautiful valleys and rolling hills and smell that smell, uh, you, uh, you're like going back in time, but this is going to be, you know, it's so funny, you know, COVID COVID hit and we shut down one of our restaurants for four months. And, uh, and, uh, I went to get the, my competition rig and I was going to start cooking Sunday supper chickens. Uh, and the last time I'd use that pit was at the Jack Daniels, 2019, and I went to go clean out the ash out of the firebox, and uh, and that was the that was the ash from my dad's last fire he ran. So there was, it, you know, uh, we I don't know. I I go to hotels now. My dad always stayed in the bed closest to the bathroom. You know, it's like I had over two hundred thousand miles probably driving all over the country with my dad cooking barbecue. So uh, we're just going to go down there. Actually, coming down to the holler. 
this year is going to be um, a tribute and a celebration to my dad. You know, we didn't get to have a funeral because of COVID. So we're going to go down there and uh, light a fire in his honor. And I'm going to have his three brothers with me. It'll be cool. I love it. Well, I would, I'm going to be there and it would be an honor for me to be able to just stir the fire, just maybe a half a turn in memory of your old man and respect for you and what you and your dad accomplished together with team cold smoke. I think it's awesome to be able to be <clears throat> that in tune with what that relationship meant and, and, and how it's going to be carried forth with the, his brothers and the cribbage table. And it's so picturesque, right? It's like painting that picture of, you didn't even mention the meat that came off the grill. You mentioned the fire and cribbage. And that's just awesome that you just, that our mind takes us there when we think about our inspiration, our influencers, our trailblazers, our dads, you know, and how important they were and who we are. And my dad passed away before he got a chance to see anything that me and my brothers, my brothers and I accomplished, whether it was, you know, he got to see his grandkids until they were two years old and then they didn't know their dad, your granddaddy anymore. And if you think about what it means to lose somebody that you're so in tune with, it can be a, you know what, it can be a son of a gun. And this year it's going to be a different aura down there around Tuffy, but I know that the spirit lives strongly and more than likely you'll walk away with some kind of hardware. I'm sure of it. Never can take Fingers that crossed. for granted. Fingers crossed. You will old man's upstairs watching down, stirring that fire with you playing cribbage with his brothers. Jed, you've been to the Jack Daniels. When he talks about that, those feelings, those sights, those smells, those touches, those tastes, Tuffy's dead on, right, about what life, how you touched on before, and what Lynchburg is all about. And this is what I'm talking about, Jed, is that this might just be another barbecue excursion for a team. It might just be another Saturday and Sunday, right? But it's so much more to different people. And that's what we have to respect in life is that, hey, we can't take anything for granted because this means everything to this man when it might not mean the same to me. But you understand what Tuffy's saying, right, Jed? Absolutely. Yeah. So Tuffy had such a blessed life with his, his dad being there, being a part of that experience, and he'll carry those memories on. Um, there might be a competitor right down the way who's, you know, having the same experience with his brother or his sister or whatever. But no, he's, he's dead on when he's talking about Lynchburg. I mean, you come from whatever direction and you just enter the hills. Uh, just the, the quietness of the community. Our, our courthouse has been there since 1873. I mean, the, the square hasn't changed really, except maybe People. ownership and name. It, it's unbelievable. Plus we paved the, the square. That's nice. It's not dirt anymore. Um, but yeah, it, it's just that small town piece of Americana and uh, having lived all over the world and coming back home, to, to Lynchburg, it definitely has that ability to just draw you in, slow you down, point out those things that are most important in your life. And uh, yeah, it might just be a barbecue competition, but it, it's so much more if it's allowed to be such, you know, I mean, our lives are so fast, but if we allow ourselves to slow down, we can have those experiences like Tuffy talked about. The, the people, uh, the people of Lynchburg, Tennessee, uh, eating breakfast on the square, having lunch at Miss Mary Bobo's, um, just it's watching the sheriffs, you know, stack the barrels. You know, it's uh, yeah. the the awards, the 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 awards. You know, unfortunately, we're not going to have the international teams is, here this year, but you know, the presence of the, you know, it could be the Polish team or the Germans, or you know, it's like. You know, it's just the excitement down there, but, but it's the people. It's like, I understand how the product, uh, became, would you say 170 some countries that, that Jack Daniels over uh, 170 you know, I, I, countries. Yeah. I mean, barbecue has taken me all over the world, literally. And, and, and to see the Jack Daniels brand as strong as it is in places like Australia, or New Zealand. It's just, uh, it's tremendous, but I can't think that that would have happened if it wouldn't have been for the amazing people, uh, that, that make that product. Well, it's the truth. It's the honesty of the, the product. You're cooking a true cut of meat and 
it, it's um, there's nothing fake about what you're doing. And, and we're doing our absolute best to put the best whiskey out there on the market. And it's with tradition, uh, generations of family. And uh, it just makes sense that you've been all over the place because you're you're doing such a great job at what you're doing and keeping it honest. Oh, come on, Jed. The humility has to stop. Yeah. It has to stop. I, I will not stand another second to hear that there's even a close whiskey to Jack Daniels. Bourbon uh, or whiskey. I'm not going to stand for it. Irish, right, Scottish, right. I'm not going to stand for it. All right, we're killing it out. Nothing, there. nothing compares to Jack Daniels, Dennis. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not just saying that. I, way before I ever was part of the family, uh, Jack Daniels was was it. And um, when you hear things like tradition and culture, and you hear about camaraderie and family, and you hear about Tuffy Stone and his dad and Team mm-hmm. Cold Smoke and three wins. I mean, three anybody, any barbecue company in the world or barbecue pitmaster would give their you know what. To have three wins at the Jack Daniels. I don't care what they say in public. I would give anything right now to have one barbecue championship at the Jack Daniels. Maybe Houston. Maybe Memphis and May. Maybe the Kansas City Royal where Tuffy's getting ready to go right now. We didn't even get in to Carolina and Memphis and the Rendezvous and Mustard and Kansas City and Texas and all of the different places where barbecue is so rich in tradition. And Tuffy mentioned Virginia. I don't even know Virginia had barbecue. Didn't even know it. I would assume West Virginia had some moonshine marinade barbecue maybe recipes going on, (laughs) but I didn't know anything about Virginia barbecue. But to hear how rich in tradition jack daniels is in lynchburg is tennessee i mean come on 16 and 17th avenue and music row even though a lot of the music coming out of there isn't country i didn't say that out loud yeah. um, I, I, but there's so much that goes in to what we're getting ready to experience mm-hmm. and, and and i just want folks to understand that when you drive into that town it's we're in a dry county folks a dry county think about that I mentioned in the beginning of this podcast that every drop of Jack Daniels, what I meant by that is that you think of other iconic brands, Budweiser, Bud Light, Coca-Cola, they're not all made and bottled in the same place. Every ounce and drop of Jack Daniels is from Lynchburg, Tennessee. That enough is in itself is so important. Jack, go ahead. You were going to say something right there. Yeah, if they come on tour with me, I'll point out one building that every drop of Jack they've ever put to their lips in there and entire life has come out of one building for the entire planet i'll point out that building if they came on tour that is unbelievable and tuffy i understand the passion and i understand the connection you have with this place but it's pretty cool that when i'm on the phone with somebody that represents the greatest whiskey brand of all time it's one of the most iconic brands of all time it is the most tattooed brand of all time, ahead of Harley Davidson, Tuffy Stone. Imagine wow. how many tattoos are in the world of old number seven. I've been so many places in Sturgis, they'd come into the tent, and they'd be like pulling up their sleeve, and they'd be like, bam, it'd be, it'd be a Vietnam vet with a number seven right there. And you're just like, wow, man, this brand means something to people. So, mm-hmm. Tuffy, you have a connection to a brand in a way to when I'm talking to people that represent the brand, they consider you family because you go there and you win this competition, but it's because – more than that. It's because of what you talked about of the tradition and your dad's story and cold smoke and your expertise and your passion and your education and your culinary flair. You are the true backyard aficionado. Talk to me right now, Tuffy, as we sit here in, in the second week of September. Is there a mental mindset? You talked about your competitive edge and that it might be there, it might not. But is there a mental mindset that starts to take over when you go into the Kansas city Royal and then you start getting ready for the Jack Daniels invitational. Absolutely. Um, I told you one of my sayings earlier, the harder I work, the luckier I get when I'm fortunate enough to cook at a world championship, I'm going to work my ass off. Um, so the process is, you know, I talked about this earlier, but it's gathering all the things that I need. It's power washing my pit. It's hand cutting every piece of hickory. It's making sure that my rubs are right, my rubs are fresh, my sauce is right, uh, my knives are sharp. Um, soon as soon as we're done with uh, talking today, I'm going right back to work on my list. Uh, old friend of mine used to say, "Plan your work and work your plan." And I got a lot of work that I have to do to get ready for the jack 
And then there's this, this, this whole mindset, you know, I got, uh, someone told me, man, I cook the same way at every contest. Well, I do my best at every contest, but when I get down to the holler, uh, I'm going to be so hyper-focused on cooking the most, per- the first time I won the Jack was 2013. Mm-hmm. And I pay attention to the weather a lot and I knew it was going to get cold down in the holler. So I told my dad, my dad would get up at two o'clock in the morning, light the fire, put the meat on at three. I said, dad, I want you to run the pit at 300 degrees, 25 degrees hotter than normal. So it's going to get cold down here by the creek. It got down to 27 degrees. I, I, I you know, I, I think about the, the ambient temperature a lot when I'm making barbecue. So anyways, my briskets are usually done 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, I had one of my briskets go till noon. Uh, that's an hour and a half before turn in time. I had, uh, you got to, you cook dark meat and white meat at the Jack. And so I, I had, uh, chicken breast going and thighs going. I had to have my chicken breast laying on top of my brisket trying to get through this. When it came, you turn in seven portions at the Jack number seven. Uh, I, I went through four racks of ribs. It was all I could do to find seven tender ribs presentation didn't look that great because they were coming from all different racks of ribs because it was cold and and all those meats were you know taking longer to get done so all the ribs that weren't uh weren't turned in my wife and my teammates tasted and they kept saying the ribs are tough the ribs are tough i said i think the ribs i turned in were tender i don't remember but we either got second or fourth in ribs and we we won the the jack Another one of my sayings is all on how you handle catastrophes. But um, I, I start visualizing my whole cook weeks out. Um, I'm just so thankful that places like uh, Jack Daniels and, and the Royal create opportunities where barbecue dreams can come true. And um, we're going to do everything we can to, to put ourselves in the best position to cook our best food. Where barbecue dreams come true. And let me ask you this, Tuffy, real quick. I'm going to be there on starting on Thursday. When I see you on Friday at the uh, the little banquet and concert Friday night before the, the fire is lit, is it a good idea to shake your hand and come up and say thank you for the podcast? Or should I just stay completely out of your way until Sunday? No, I, the, the only time, the only time, I, you, you don't have to stay out of my way at all. You know, um, I, uh, I, I got some focus times during the contest. Um, Friday night's not one of them. Uh, Saturday morning, uh, probably starting about 10, 1030. The dance starts to get a little more complicated. But, you know, I think because of my barbecue life and doing barbecue pit masters for all those years, lots of people want to come by and say hi. And I just, honestly speaking, I, I make sure I say hi to people. A lot of times my my cook will get disrupted by a knock on the door, but I'm just there to say hello to all these folks that come by. And, and I, it's going to be my honor to shake your hand and to thank you for letting me be on your podcast. So I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you up on the hill and, uh, and seeing, you know, I hope you come by the, the site. I'll give you the nickel tour there. And after turn ins, you can try some, some barbecue. Well, 100%, I'll be humbled to shake your hand. And I hate saying humbled. I'm already humbled because life humbles me every day. I think humility plays a key role in success and being able to accept success, which is very hard. And I could tell that it's probably hard for you to accept so much success in something that we've been doing for hundreds of years, but so well deserved. And I wanted to say we are going to be documenting. Mm hmm. The Jack Daniels. We're going to have a full-blown video crew there with audio and everything going on. And I've asked permission, Tuffy, and you're going to have to think about this. I don't know if Greg and Jed have ran it by you, but the nickel tour might turn into maybe me coming in there and, and getting a little taste of the sauce or the rub or something on film you and talking on. to you a little bit. I'm going to come on. I'm going to do it because I'm so intrigued by what you do. <laughs> I, I absolutely love – Genius, And I'm not saying that I want to throw that word around like it's nothing. I'm not saying that you have 181 IQ. But genius comes in different formats. And I know that there's a Webster's Dictionary definition of genius. But I just love when people are so good at what they were put on earth to do. Jed, 
Mm. Tuffy mentioned the word that means so much in my life because of baseball. I had a competitive baseball career up to D1 college. I was an overachiever. I should have never been in D1, but the coach loved how I ran out first base every time and I ran down fly balls. I was maybe D2 at the best, probably junior college out of high school, but I got a D1 scholarship based on this word visualization because Ted Williams in his book, The Science of Hitting, wrote about the art, the art of visualization. Visualize, visualize with me for a second, Mr. Jen. Yep. Paint this picture of Lynchburg, what Tuffy and I are going to get to see. It's Tuffy's first time going there. Let's assume that. It's my first time at the Invitational, 2021. What are we going to vi- – what can we visualize? What can we get ready for? Paint these senses for me. you got a free canvas right now. Start throwing your oils at it. Throw right. down. This is what I do when I go into a hunt, Jed. I picture the roost. Where are they sleeping? Where are they coming from? What's the wind doing? What's the sun doing? What's the barometric pressure? What's the temperature? What's my hide like? Is it mine in a yeah. cornfield? Am I in rice stubble? Am I in water? Am I in an oxbow? Am I in flooded timber of Arkansas or on the Mississippi? I visualize yeah. this like a kid in a candy store the night before. I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about <clears> it, no <throat> pun intended. But what can our folks get ready for as we get ready for the 2021 Jack Daniels Invitational in Lynchburg, Tennessee? Well, I could be honest with you that you just scared the hell out of me because the whole time you were just talking, I was thinking ahead of time, the way he's describing it, we're talking to a a guy who's won the World Series three times. The World Series of Barbecue comes to Lynchburg, Tennessee, and he's won it three times. So I don't know if your listeners are are hearing what he's, he's talking about, but this he's a master in his craft. And uh, he, he is extremely humble. I can tell you what we hope for. I can't tell you what's going to happen. Um, we've had extremely cold temperatures like Tuffy was talking about. And uh, we moved the, the actual invitational barbecue up because it's going to rain, man. You know, barbecue weekend, it could be in the middle of a drought and we will have a shower. And uh, so we moved it up. What I hope people experience is when they come into the holler um, early morning, it's going to be nice and cool. Uh, It's definitely going to be October. Colors of the tree should be changing. Uh, That nice, cool breeze should be pushing the mash around the town a good bit. So the smells, roll your windows down. If you come into town, just roll the windows down. You'll be passing by barrel houses. You'll hear You'll smell that sweet smell of the whiskey in the air. At the same time, you'll be getting the uh, the mash. The community stop for stop for breakfast. Say hi to somebody. You know, Uh, you're going to see people mealing around on the square. We're hoping to have arts and crafts. So you'll see a lot of local artisans with their their stuff for sale. It could be woodwork, basket weaving, painting. Um, There's going to be music on the square. There's going to be a walk through the actual event space. So you can walk past Tuffy's location. I don't know if he'll be willing to talk to you, but um, definitely walk by and see how the guys and gals who are invited into the community for this invitation are actually doing their craft. And uh, it's just going to be a a small town vibe with a whole lot of visitors. It's one of our largest weekends. It's one of our largest weekends. So um, we tend to bus people around. So definitely look for parking. But the environment that it's set in, it's, it's so unique. It's not the big Houston where it goes over acres and acres and acres where there's a Ferris wheel. This is all about the competition. It's all about the meat. And uh, it, it should be a great, cool, nice day. And we're hoping, we're praying for clear skies. We're did you, did you want to pray for clear does skies? Does this ring a bell, Tuffy? Did you have something to say on that? Yeah, I just, I, you know, so here, here. So they have what's called the draw, the jack draw. And when the jack draw happens, they're going to take every winner who won a state championship from every state. And they're going to put them, they're going to put a, uh, uh, a bung in a bag and they're going to draw and one of those winners that represents that state is going to get to come and cook at the jack daniels world barbecue invitation and and then if there there's certain contests that are automatics like when you win memphis in may it's an automatic when you win the american royal open it's an automatic when you win the houston livestock rodeo show it's an automatic but on the draw all the teams eventually at the end of that day 
find out <clears throat> whether or not they're going to go cook the Jack Daniels World Barbecue Invitational. And when you find out that you get to cook the Jack, the emotion and the joy that you experience, it's like I'm going I'm going to cook a world championship. I'm going to cook the Jack. And, and anybody that ever – I'm getting goosebumps. Anybody that gets that experience just – get so emotional and so excited. It's like you talk about baseball and you, you, you yep. got a scholarship D one because of your effort. Well, uh, getting to the jacks, like getting that scholarship. And, and so when you start getting closer to Lynchburg, Tennessee, you get into some of the prettiest, I travel all over the country and, and, the, and, and that area is as pretty as you'll get, uh, it's it's just these gorgeous rolling hills. And as you get roll into the town of Lynchburg, Tennessee, you're going to see some banners letting you know that you've arrived at the, the World Invitational. They're and already up. up. They're up. Duffy, they're already up. And and so you, you're going to you, your excitement just grows as you start to slowly work your way into town and you see that. And then you get to a town square like you don't even think. I mean. It's like if if no, if no one's ever been to a town square like Lynchburg, Tennessee, you need to go. And and there's certain things. If if anybody watching this podcast, it's your first time at the Jack, you need to make reservations at Miss Mary Bobo's. Yeah, you and do. you need to set a tour to go and uh, set a reservation to go tour the distillery. Mm-hmm. And there's certain things that you need to do. Uh, but as you get into this this gorgeous town, you're gonna quickly. If you just watch, you're going to see uh, a type of person, a, a community of people that are so special. Um, and, and, and especially anybody's coming from a big city, you really need to get down there and savor this place and these people in this community. Um, it's just amazing. And, 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 you know, you mentioned having breakfast on the town square. We do it every morning. But, you know, I don't want all your listeners to come because we're not going to be able to get a seat. <laughs> you, won't, you, won't be able to get a, you won't be able to get a seat. You might have to play that game where you buy everybody <laughs> coffee. <Yeah. laughs> but and, and look, it will be right down, uh, right down on the creek. And I'll have a banner up that says Cool Smoke. And anybody coming through that's that, that, that come by, I'll be there Thursday. I'll be there Friday. Mm-hmm. Saturday, if you come by after two, uh, I will, I'll tell you about what I know about barbecue, answer any questions that you might have, but come, it's just, a, it's, it's really a special event. I cannot wait. Tuffy, finish the podcast by telling our listeners, you mentioned red, dark, you said dark and white. I'm going to guess it's going to be brisket, ribs and chicken. Is this correct? You got to do. Uh, so we got four categories. Mm-hmm. The first one we're going to turn in is chicken. And unlike many other competitions, uh, a lot of people cook chicken thighs because chicken thighs are very uh, forgiving. But uh, the Jack, you're going to turn in both white meat and dark meat. You need to turn in seven portions for number seven. Uh, then we're going to go into pork ribs. Most people will turn in St. Louis cut spares, but you can do loin back ribs or, or spare ribs. It's your choice. Then we're going to go into pork butt or pork shoulder. And then last but not least, we're going to finish it up with brisket. Again, seven, a minimum of seven portions of all those. And they're going to be turned in with uh, in little styrofoam clamshells like you get takeout in a restaurant. There's going to be a sauce competition. There's going to be uh, dessert. dessert. The desserts are usually pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember. Are there side, uh, Jed, are there side? I, I'm trying I to can't look remember. I can't remember if there's side or not. I but think there just, may have been a side in the past. But this is a very intimate, special contest. It's a world championship, and you get to walk so you get to walk right beside all the teams. And but it's just it's so approachable. I think it's just a. It's a beautiful glimpse into Americana, I think. It's just mm-hmm. it's really nice. I should a brisket break when you hold it on your finger, Tuffy? I uh, it depends on your preference a little bit. So in competition brisket, uh it would you'd be able to slice it 
and gently lift it on your finger. And it shouldn't break, but it shouldn't take much for it to break. Um, and, and your temperatures that you were talking about earlier that Matt uh, had talked about, you know, that 205, 207 and, and the, the, the rest. And that's spot on. You know, this this probably another episode, another day, you know, this whole time and temperature and doneness, the lower temperature that we cook at, the lower the internal meat temperature is going to be done at. The higher the uh, pit temperature we cook at, the higher the, the meat temperature is going to be done at. So it's kind of strange. So like a lot of times in my restaurant, you know, I, I'll cook briskets at 200 degrees and those briskets will be done about 190 or something like that. But on my stick burner, I'm cooking 275, 300, and those briskets are going to be every bit of 205, 207. The point's probably going to be 210. Um, but, you know, we want to be able to hold a slice, but you, the texture is like this silky, gentle chew. It's not, it's not springy. It's not, it's not uh, chewy at all. Tuffy, in duck hunting, your presentation of your decoys, your rig, your jerk string, ripples on the water, making it realistic, muddy water, chocolate milk effect, getting out and moving around and scurrying up the sediments. In fly fishing, the presentation is everything, how the fly hits the water, the hatch is alive, how the, 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 the current of the water meets the steel water. There's so much to think about when you're thinking about presentation. With your background of French culinary art, your education in French cuisine, um, I would assume that you have a very great knack for presentation. Because to me, barbecue, I want to open that thing up and see a mesh, right? I'm ready to get it all over my fingers and my lips. And, you know, traditional Americana barbecue, you're going to get messy. How important is presentation to the judges? Do they really even give a rat's you-know-what when it comes to opening up that box? Well, I mean, I've taken second place and lost by one presentation point before. So, um, so while I still did well for the contest, I would have preferred to have won it than taken second by one presentation point. I think everything's important, just like duck hunting and fly fishing. Everything's important. I, I, I think it all comes together. Uh, if that fly line's not dragging right and it's, and it's pulling your fly across the water to where it's not looking like a natural drift, that's going to mess you up. Uh, I, I'm better at sitting in the pit and, and, and shooting ducks than I am about getting them to the pit. Uh, so I'll leave that to your expertise, but you know, I can talk a lot about fly fishing, but, um, but I think everything's important, but the most important, so anybody's listening, interested in doing competition barbecue, my two guiding lights, my two focal points more so than anything are treating, giving it the right amount of smoke and getting that perfect tenderness. I don't care if it's ice cream, Caesar salad, fried chicken, or barbecue. The best is going to be the one that always has the best texture. So how does Caesar salad fall into this? Crispy romaine, a nice, fresh, crunchy crouton, the right amount of dressing. It's dressed enough, but it's not dressed too much. Ice cream, that the best, you know, creamiest, you know, you talked earlier about, you know, brisket sometimes being a little too rich for you. You know, I can feel that way too. But, but if you, if you can, and, and the more that we cook barbecue, you know, brisket, uh, I think, I think we're successful the first time we cook brisket. If we cook something that's got a nice tender chew to it, it's, it's moist and it's got some good flavor, but we can get it to a level that just becomes more and more sublime, more and more just perfect. And, you know, ribs is probably a better example. We talk about a rib falling off the bone. Well, no one likes tough barbecue. And so no one likes chewy barbecue. Most barbecues usually tough cuts of meat. And, and, and ribs, I think why people like a rib falling off the bone, because at least it's tender. But when you get really, and you know this, when you get really good at cooking ribs, it's like where your teeth land on the meat, that meat comes cleanly from the bone, but the rest stays intact. And it's got like this nice silky chew that's gentle, but it's not mealy. It's not overcooked. It's not disintegrated. Uh, and it's not like a rubber band. And, and But, you know, presentation is important, but texture and taste are your, are, your, are your big two. Chad, I've been invited to so many dinners and so many nice restaurants and so many good sushi bars and so many unbelievable open spit fires 
in duck camp and where I know there's going to be a good cook present. Like Mr. Billy Bogey in Arkansas, his smothered deer steak would make all three of us slap our mama right now. <laughs> you know, and, and no disrespect to our mamas. I'm just using a Southern term because I mm-hmm. love the South. I think the Southern part of our country, the Southeast is the number one destination in the world. I've been all over the world. And I love the South part of America. I don't know what it is. I just love Everything from the camaraderie to the hunting to the fishing to the barbecue to the cooking to the cuisine, Cajun country in Louisiana, you name it. I've done it. I know you guys have too. I want to be the adopted son of the South. That's why I've self-termed myself the adopted son of the South. But Jed, Mm. I don't think in my entire life I've been so excited to eat some kind of food that I am to eat Tuffy Stone's barbecue in about under a month. Like I'm getting jitters, like a, like an (laughs) addict, like I'm getting shakes right now. Like I'm so excited to eat this man's food. Jed, Last thoughts, final thoughts. Thank you so much for being here. The 2021 Jack Daniels Invitational World Championship Barbecue, Lynchburg, Tennessee, the weekend of October 7th and 8th and 9th. Chad, come oh. on, man. Give us some final thoughts. Give us some words of wisdom, brother. I got to tell you, we're super honored to have it hosted in our hometown again. And uh, we're so excited for everybody to show up. I'll be here all three days. I'll be chest bumping both of y'all. I'll be at the Friday night meal and the the music and all that. And I'll be walking around the event space. I'm equally as excited because we missed out last year, right? So I'm so excited to have everybody back in town. And if you have listeners, like Tuffy said, you've got to come down. You've got to experience it. I think what makes it so hard uh, to describe this place is that Not that we don't have anything going on. It's just so different than maybe if you live in a big town in a big city to to understand what's going on, you know. And and so we're excited. We're pumped. We're we're so happy about this thing going off this year. And uh, we're ready for it. We're ready for you, Tuffy. Come on down, man. Tuffy, um, I got to ask this question to end this podcast. Friday night, I was asked to help with the music. We have a band coming out of Nashville called Dean James and the Treatment. This band will absolutely blow both of your minds. They work with Kid Rock, Bobby Ritchie. They are just signed a record deal. Dean is an absolute, okay, I'm going to throw it around again, genius. He plays the keyboard, the piano, the harmonica, the stand-up bass, the bass guitar. He plays an acoustic guitar. He plays an electric guitar. He plays drums like Neil Peart of Rush, the late rest in peace Neil Peart. He is a badass, Tuffy. Wow. My my question to you, Tuffy, is two-part. One, I know it's competition. I know you got to focus. But can we share, like Mr. Kevin said, some conversation over one Jack Daniels on Friday night during the music? And the second part of the question is – I forgot to mention Dean James can do any cover from Prince to Guns N' Roses to Stevie wow. Wonder, and he got a ton of great originals. What song would you like to request to the man? What are me and you going to jive to, and can we share Jack Daniels during that song? Yeah, absolutely. It'd be I, I feel honored. Uh, it'll be awesome. Uh, golly, what song? I don't know. I probably need to reach out to my uh, uncles and see if we can't do something to honor my dad and and. and yeah. See if they've got an opinion. So I'll please do an it. email with that. He needs yeah. to do some Gordon Lightfoot, man. We could do Gordon Lightfoot. Hey, there's 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 what there's what in Nashville. There's what you call the hundred dollar songs. Free yeah. bird, free bird. You know, free there's the songs that when the band gets requests, they're you know they get requested so much they start charging a, a, yeah. a hundy spot on it. So I think bet about, you he's never gotten Gordon Lightfoot requested. Oh, I don't know. He's gotten by me, <laughs> Rupert Holmes. If, if you like pina colada, I and guess, he, and he uh, nails it. He nails them all. So if you can get it to me in, in the next little bit. Mr. Yeah, Tommy Stone and Jen, yeah. if you have any, I can get with Dean and him and the band can work it out. But if it's something that would memorialize your dad and have me and you over a nice little conversation with Jed and Greg yeah. and Casey and Tommy and Mr. Kevin and all the men and women in the entire Jack Daniels family up there on Barbecue Hill, I absolutely cannot wait for this event. Tuffy Stone, congratulations on your success, and thank you. Jed, congratulations on working for the most badass brand oh. in the existence of the whole entire freaking world. This has been another episode 
of This Life Ain't For Everybody, brought to you again by our friends and family. Enjoy it responsibly. Never allow underage drinking. The iconic Jack Daniels Tennessee Sour Mash Whiskey, Lynchburg, Tennessee. The Invitational Barbecue Championships coming up October 7th, 8th, and 9th, 2021, right in Jack's hometown, Lynchburg, Tennessee. I'm Chad Belding. Tom, Jake, hit that button. We're going out with Leith Lofton. What you going to do when the money's all gone? Here I'll leave. Well, that's what I think. I don't believe heaven has a bank. Make good use of your time on earth.